works at the Montauk Point Lighthouse, and he's written numerous books on Montauk, which you see on the table right here. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about his new book, American Gibraltar. So everyone welcome Henry Osmer. Well, thank you, Gina. Nice introduction. Uh, yeah, I've written, I've written four books about Montauk, and uh, my primary focus has always been the lighthouse because I've been working there now for 11 years. Uh, but then uh, uh, an individual out in Montauk gave me an idea. He said, you know, he said, did you ever think about uh, focusing on the uh, military side of Montauk? And I had heard bits and pieces of what uh, Montauk's involvement was in uh, various wars of our country, but I never really, you know, focused in on it entirely, and that kind of gave me uh, the impetus to write American Gibraltar. Uh, you notice it says the wars of America. It's not just uh, 20th century wars. This is beginning with the Indian Wars back in the 1600s, uh, back in the days when East Hampton town was settled. Uh, most people think of Montauk primarily as, you know, for the obvious, the beaches, the fishing, uh, nice seafood restaurants, shorefront hotels, motels, and of course the lighthouse. Uh, but at different points in its history, Montauk was home to the Army, the Navy, uh, the Air Force, and the Coast Guard. Uh, the word Montauk itself, uh, by the way, is an Indian word, and it really refers to uh, four different interpretations kind of it's, uh, indicated as being fort place or high land, that kind of thing. Uh, which to me always brings to mind the Montauk Manor, up on a hill and it's in a commanding place, but at one time there was an Indian fort up in that very place. Uh, the early inhabitants of uh, Montauk were the Montaukets. They were the uh, Indian tribe, and they were actually the most powerful tribe on Long Island. Montaukets were the most powerful tribe on Long Island. They were very resourceful people. They were part of the Algonquin tribe. And they were the most powerful on Long Island, and other tribes kind of paid homage to them. And around the time that East Hampton was settled in 1648, uh, shortly after that, there was a, a sachem, which was the word for chief. Uh, the sachem of the Montaukets was a man named Wyandanche. And there's a community on Long Island that bears his name. Uh, he was probably one of the most powerful uh, chiefs of the tribe. He also uh, befriended uh, Lion Gardner. Lion Gardner, of course, the man who uh, owned Gardner's Island. And the Montaukets were very resourceful people. They, uh, they taught the settlers of East Hampton uh, how to hunt, trap, fish, and to harvest whales, meaning to, you know, how to extract the oil from it. Uh, however, the Montaukett Indians uh, did have their enemies. They weren't on Long Island, though. They were the, uh, the uh, Indian tribes of Connecticut and Rhode Island, the Niantics, the Narragansetts, the Pequots. Uh, and frequently, there would be conflict between the Montaukets and these various tribes. It, it, this primarily during like the 1630s into the 1660s. And uh, there was one battle fought in August of 1653 at Montauk with the Niantics at a place called Massacre Valley, which uh, was considered to be the bloodiest battle on Montauk soil. Uh, 30 members of the Montauk tribe were killed during that battle. It actually was fought very near where the Montauk Inn is located. And uh, there's a story that Wyandanche's daughter was going to be married in a tribal ceremony out there in Montauk, and uh, apparently, it, as during the ceremony or just before, I think it was, uh, the Montaukets kind of let their guard down a little bit, and the Niantics were in the area, and they kind of raided the place, killed the bridegroom, mm -hmm. grabbed the daughter, and ran off with her, kidnapped her. It was Lion Gardner who. Uh, got the ransom to get her back. So you can see a good reason why uh, Lion Gardner and Wyandanch became such uh, good friends. Uh, 
Flying Gage died in 1659, and uh, after that, uh, apparently there was not a man of such influence leaving the tribe any longer, and consequently threats from those tribes of Connecticut and Rhode Island increased. And for protection, uh, a lot of these Indians moved into uh, this area here, and uh, they relocated to places, which uh, one of which is known as Freetown, which is not too far away from here in East Hampton. Uh, the Indians gradually, you know, were gone from Montauk, and from the 1660s into the 1920s, Montauk was primarily a place for cattle and horses to graze. And it became uh, an annual event for uh, the animals to parade to Montauk every spring and to parade them back right around November 1st of every year. I always thought that was quite, that had to be interesting when it got into the 1920s because now you had paved roads and cars around. But they still had these animals parading back and forth every year. Now, into the 18th century, of course, you know, Long Island was part of New York, or colony of uh, England. And as we know, with the American Revolution, uh, the relationship between uh, the colonists and the British deteriorated, and eventually we had the revolution going on. Well, the East Hampton residents were concerned about British attacks on the Montauk Peninsula because they were afraid of the animals being captured. And occasionally, the British did raid Montauk and steal some of the cattle and sheep that were out there. Uh, George Washington himself was aware of this situation. And uh, in July of 1775, he notified the authorities of East Hampton that a British fleet was headed their way and that they better protect their cattle. Of course, uh, the people of East Hampton were pleading with uh, the uh, colonial government to uh, get protection for the cattle, but they didn't really have men to spare. They had to be used elsewhere. Uh, a small group, though, was sent out in 1776 to protect the cattle, and uh, there was an individual by the name of Captain John Dayton who lived right here in East Hampton, and he had a very shrewd plan that uh, apparently worked. Uh, and I want to quote this from uh, Henry Hedges, who was an early historian of East Hampton. Uh, and this is what he had to say about John Dayton. He said, uh, Captain Dayton thought he could prevent the landing of the British and save the cattle. Forty of his neighbors accompanied him to Montauk. <coughs> he selected a hill, marched over it at the head of his company, descended into a hollow where he was out of sight of the fleet. Shifting the position of his men, and each exchanging his coat, he again led them back to the starting place over the hill, and thus the company continued their march over and around the hill. The maneuver was calculated to produce this impression upon the fleet that a large army were marching and encamping in the vale below. Whether this strategy was the cause or not, the result was that the British did not land and the flocks were safe. So Dayton really did this clever little ruse to give the British the impression that there was a large army here by keep changing coats and everything. And apparently it worked. Uh, in August of 1776, of course, the Battle of Long Island was fought, and that was in Brooklyn, uh, and it was a loss. Uh, General William Howe defeated Washington. Washington had a retreat to, Wash to uh, Manhattan across the East River under the cover of fog. And shortly after that, all of Long Island, including East Hampton, Montauk, fell under British control, and there were periodic raids of the cattle on the Montauk Peninsula. The British maintained a fleet out here. Uh, one of their ships was the uh, Culloden. Uh, the Culloden uh, was in Gardner's Bay, and this ship had 74 guns on it. It was 170 feet long, about 47 feet wide, and had a crew of about 650. And in January of 1781, uh, three French ships, which had been anchored off Newport, began to make a move toward Long Island to uh, kind of try to aid the American cause. Well, the British were going to set out with the Cologne and some of their other boats to intercept the French fleet. 
The only problem was a snowstorm broke out and made things very hectic. And the Culloden uh, was the only ship that didn't uh, fare very well. The other British ships managed to get uh, secure anchorage. Uh, the Culloden ended up striking some rocks at a place called Shaglong Reef, which is near Montauk Point. And it basically limped its way into Fort Pond Bay, Montauk, and ran aground. Uh, the British burned the ship to the waterline. Uh, to prevent the removal of guns by the Americans. The entire crew was, was safe. You know, there was no loss of life with the Cologne. And of course, you know, two years later the war ended and you know, the British had departed and that was the end of the British influence uh, on Long Island. However, the War of 1812 posed another threat because now the British were again anchored in Gardner's Bay threatening the livestock. And at this time, uh, a young man named Jared Hand was the keeper of the Montauk Lighthouse. And uh, the Lighthouse Service provided him with a pair of spy glasses so he could observe the movements of British ships in the region. Uh, there was concern that the British were going to try to capture the lighthouse and use it for its own benefit. So uh, the, a federal, the federal agent at Sag Harbor, a man by the name of Henry Packard Daring, uh, retrieved all of the oil and the lighting apparatus from the lighthouse, <coughs> bless you, and secured it until the war was ended, just so the British wouldn't get hold of it. But there is a little story that uh, kind of goes with uh, the Montauk involvement of the War of 1812, and it involved this man, Commodore Thomas Hardy. Uh, he was uh, on one of the British ships in Gardner's Bay, and uh, a raid was conducted and some cattle were taken. Well, apparently there was a man living on Montauk who was one of the herders out there, and his name was uh, Uriah Payne. And he was not particularly pleased with the fact that these cattle were taken. He commandeered a uh, Montaukan Indian into uh, one of their canoes and demanded that the Indian row him out to Hardy's ship, and he demanded to see him. And the Indian took him out there. He boarded the ship, and he demanded to see Commodore Hardy, because as he put it, uh, either he's going to get payment for those cattle, or he was going to trash the whole British fleet. <laughs> now, Uriah Miller was a man of about, say, 30 at the time. Uh, Hardy was so aghast at this man's audacity, he paid him. And he declared him the bravest man in America. So Hardy got his money, and he went back home. So, uh, by the way, there were some British who did desert uh, during the War of 1812 and the Revolution too. They, you know, they stayed on Long Island. Uh, the Civil War did not touch Montauk at all directly. Uh, there is a little uh, connection with it all. But it's a little, it's a bit of a stretch, but I do include it uh, because in 1860 the lighthouse was renovated. Uh, the original lighthouse was an 80-foot tall structure. The lighthouse you see today is 110 feet. And while they were putting in that additional 30 feet and redoing the stairs and the tower, they put an interior wall in to, to uh, secure the steps. In that brick, they put like this block. And on it, they put the names of the lighthouse committee at the time who was involved with the construction. And the weird part was there were four names on that block of cement. When the Civil War broke out, two of them became Union generals. One became a Confederate general and a Confederate admiral. <laughs> so that, that was, in a way, a little bit of a connection. As far as the Civil War itself reaching Long Island, uh, one source I found said that Confederate ships were known to be as close as 90 miles from Montauk Point. And that was about as close as it got. So basically, the Civil War years were, you know, quiet. Uh, the Spanish-American War was uh, a little bit different. Uh, the the war, of course, did not take place on Long Island. It was down in Cuba, but Montauk did get involved after the war. Uh, what happened was that uh, a lot of these soldiers that fought in Cuba contracted a lot of diseases down there. They really weren't ready to fight in, the, in these types of climates. They got illnesses. It was like a laundry list. They had malaria, yellow fever, 
dys dysentery, typhoid. Uh, it was just a mess. And a lot of these men were just so ill. And there was concern about where these soldiers were going to be quartered once they got back to the States, because you didn't want to put them too near the general population. Well, Theodore Roosevelt, Colonel Roosevelt, and his Rough Riders, you know, they, they made their fame in the Spanish-American War. Roosevelt, of course, knew Long Island. And one thing he did know is that Montauk was basically deserted, except for those cattle and sheep running around. So he told the government, you know, Montauk might be a good place to set up a camp, excuse me, set up a camp, <clears throat> and let these men basically get rest, relaxation, and uh, medical treatment. So they established what was called Camp Wyckoff. Uh, Wyckoff was the name of one of the first soldiers killed in the Battle of San Juan Hill. So the name was uh, affixed to the camp. And the, uh, it, w it, didn't, it wasn't all that difficult for the camp to be uh, fortified because, as you can see here, uh, the railroad was already out there. I mean, Camp Wyckoff was established in 1898, which was the year of the war. The railroad had already made it to Montauk in 1895. So a lot of supplies were brought out via rail. Other, other things were brought by boat. The troops from Cuba were all brought by boat. They were brought over in uh, transports. And the site had to be uh, a little tough to take, because uh, when these boats docked in Fort Palm Bay, uh, on many occasions, these men were basically staggering and collapsing uh, right on the dock. I mean, they were just so sick. It, was just a, it had to be a frightful sight. And uh, in all, approximately 30,000 troops came to Montauk uh, for uh, rest and relaxation. Uh, this is just a, a section of what the camp looked like. Uh, of course, in those days, you know, having all the cattle and sheep out there, they kept the grounds pretty well manicured so you could see for miles. That's why I love some of these old pictures. The views were just so expansive. I mean, today, of course, you know, we have trees and everywhere, so you don't really get as many of the nice views as they once did. Now, even though the men uh, had a nice area to go to, uh, many of them did do well. I mean, they did respond to the climate, uh, the fresh air. I think Roosevelt was always the outdoors type. You know, he, he believed in the invigor invigorating outdoor life, and many of the men responded to this, but there were stories of uh, poor conditions and insufficient equipment uh, and shortages of food at the camp. And uh, in spite of aid from outside organizations, even like women's organizations right back here in this village, who uh, put clothes together and food and sent things out, uh, one of the newspapers said, death continues its slaughter at Camp Wyckoff. So apparently, it wasn't as good as they might have hoped. And uh, Roosevelt himself uh, spent some time in the tents. He also was quartered at Third House. Uh, this building still exists at Montauk. It was built around 1806, I believe. And, uh, but he did spend some time in the tents with his men. Uh, the men really admired Roosevelt. I mean, they, they adored the colonel, as one source said. And uh, while he was here, uh, his family came out to visit. And his son, Theodore Jr., uh, was a, a boy of about 11 at the time. And apparently one day he was running around third house, and there was a big pile of hay in the back. And as a young boy, you know, he wanted to jump on the hay, you know, having fun. Uh, the man running third house at the time was a man named Theodore Conklin who told young Teddy to stop it. Young Teddy didn't stop it. Conklin grabbed the kid and proceeded to thrash him. Colonel Roosevelt happened to drive up. He saw what was going on, and what did he say? Give it to him, Captain Conklin. Let him have it. <laughs> you wouldn't hear that today. <laughs> but apparently, uh, after this little incident, <coughs> Roosevelt took his son with him keep an eye on. Apparently his son was a little bit of a handful. Uh, these stories of poor conditions that I just referred to got to the ears of President William McKinley. And McKinley himself planned a visit to Montauk to see the camp. And 
in September, he did just that. Here is the, the picture of him out here. McKinley is right. It doesn't work. <laughs> uh, Got to do the old-fashioned way. McKinley is this bald-headed gentleman right here with his hat off. Mm -hmm. Okay? He came at the beginning of September, and he went for a tour of the camp. He spoke to a few of the sick soldiers, and he ended up giving a speech to the men on a big hill, several thousand men. And basically, he said that he was very pleased with what he saw. He thought conditions were good. He thought the men were responding. He felt that they were uh, invigorated. He, so you know, he came away feeling pretty good about things. However, a man by the name of Edward Boughton, who at that time was the editor of the East Hampton Star, uh, had an editorial in the paper at the time. And I'm just quoting a couple of sentences. He said, President McKinley's famous visit was a farce. While he shook hands with officers and was shown through the hospitals, men were dying out in the tents of the regulars without care and proper medical attention. So apparently Mr. Bowden felt that uh, President McKinley was steered and shown what they wanted him to see. This later on wasn't necessarily proven to be true. I mean, there were some soldiers who were, let's be honest, they were beyond help. I mean, they were dying. Uh, like I said to you before, 30,000 troops were out there. Only about 300 of them actually died. <clears throat> now, I've told this to people, even when I talk to people at the lighthouse, and my honest feeling is, given the conditions, the time period we're talking about, I don't think that's a bad percentage. Out of 30,000, you only lose 300. Given the, given the fact what medicine was in those days, the availability of medicine, and the conditions you were dealing with, I think they did, under the circumstances, pretty well. Uh, there's a picture that exists, I don't have it here, but there's a picture that exists of uh, the cemetery that was built where these uh, soldiers were buried, but it was only a temporary arrangement. These, these caskets were actually above ground and covered with dirt, and big crosses put on top of them. And what they did, they just left them that way until families were notified, and, they were, and then they were transported by rail back to wherever they were going to be buried. Some of the families could not afford the $35 fee. So the government did a good thing. They set aside some land in Brooklyn and uh, made it a national, it's actually today known as Cypress Hills National Cemetery, which is uh, right on the border of Brooklyn and Queens. And an area was set aside specifically for some of these men to be interred at North <coughs> So when I read that, I thought, hey, that was a really good thing for them to do that. Uh, when Roosevelt was at Montauk, he found time to visit the lighthouse. And that's what it would have looked like when he visited. He came out with his entourage. He had a group of men with him, and uh, he visited. Matter of fact, uh, this library has the uh, register book, which has uh, Roosevelt's signature in it. I got to see that, and that uh, kind of was exciting to look at. And Rose, I, I, I want, this story I, I thought about including, and then I thought maybe I shouldn't, but I, I, it's a good story, and I think it's worth telling. This is a picture of Theodore Roosevelt and Gordon Johnston. Gordon Johnston was Roosevelt's orderly. He was like his right-hand man while they at the camp. And this story, to me, just tells you the kind of a man Roosevelt was. When the men uh, had time, which, you know, when they got well and they were able to get around, a lot of them would go on horseback, gallop over the hills of Montauk. Some of them would go down to the beach, take a dip in the ocean. I mean, they were really enjoying it. Roosevelt did the same. One day, he took a trip with, with Johnston down to Ditch Plains. The oak that, which is the ocean side of Montauk. And when they hit the beach, Roosevelt took one look at the breakers out there, which were really big. And in typical Roosevelt fashion, he said, bully. Perfectly bully. He goes, I shall go in. So he proceeds to strip down and get ready to take a dip. So he hands the reins of his horse over to Johnston, which is proper. But before he went in the water, he turned around and he 
said to Johnston, when I come out, I'll hold your horse. You go in. <laughs> now, you know, Roosevelt goes in, and Johnston's standing on the beach scratching his head thinking, a colonel is going to hold a private's horse? He's, it, it's, not, it's not protocol. He just felt very, very awkward about that. So after a while, Roosevelt finishes his swim, comes out thoroughly invigorated, gets his clothes back on, goes over to Johnston, and goes, okay, Johnston, your turn. Well, Johnston was all flustered, and he said, well, sir, he said, it's absolutely unmilitary for a private to let a colonel hold his horse. Roosevelt looked him straight in the eye and just insisted. He says, you can't pass up this opportunity. And basically told him, it's an order. Johnston went in the water. Enjoyed it. And Johnston himself went on to become a lieutenant colonel, received numerous honors, including the Congressional Medal of Honor, Distinguished Service Medal, and Distinguished Service Cross in World War I. But he always said it in his whole entire military career, he never forgot that day on the beach with the colonel. It just shows you the kind of a man Roosevelt really was. I always describe him, I mean, he was a colonel, okay, he was an officer, but he could also be one of the guys. Uh, among the men that were at uh, Montauk were the Buffalo soldiers. These were black men. They were members of the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantry. Uh, the Cavalry, by the way, they were the eyes, they were the scouts. And the Infantry, they were more of the muscle, they were the combat. But these black men were members of both. And Roosevelt himself acknowledged that without the gutsy fighting ability of these men, chances are San Juan Hill might not have been taken. These men were treated as equals at Camp Wyckoff. And remember, we're talking about 1898 when, you know, blacks were nowhere near being equal. But at the camp, they were. And they acknowledged and adored the colonel just as much as any of the white soldiers did. By October of 1898, troops were leaving. Roosevelt himself was only there for about a month. And by December, the camp was officially, quote, declared no more. It was basically uh, all removed. There are really no remains of Camp Wyckoff. It was basically all a tent type of thing. But of course, Third House is uh, still there. Uh, in the 20th century, you have World War I, and this is a picture of the old Montauk fishing village uh, on the shores of Fort Pond Bay, Fort Pond below it, and the current village of Montauk would be south, probably about a mile from where the old village was. This isn't the type of village you see in Montauk today. This village was, was basically put together with old fishing crates and uh, spare lumber. It was, a, it was basically shacks. But fishermen would come here not all of them stayed there all year round. Uh, one guy in particular was a man named Edwin B. Tuttle, who was really like one of the pioneers uh, who really got the fishing business going down there. But he was from East Marion, up on the North Fork. And this village, and here you can see the railroad tracks coming into the village, uh, this village uh, began to see some activity in uh, 1917 and 18 because you know, the United States was getting into the First World War. And two days before the United States declared war on Germany, which was April 6th of 1917, uh, Naval Base Number 4 was established at Montauk. It basically was a training and enrollment camp for Long Island, and it operated mostly as a lookout and uh, guard post. Uh, they had dirigibles out there, which did overhead surveys of eastern Long Island, the waters of Long Island Sound, the ocean. Uh, Montauk was a strategic location. I think we have to realize that more in the 20th century. Given its location, it was to me, it was, I always like to see it as a junction. The ships coming from Europe, you know, you, you pass Montauk on the south side, you're going along the south side toward New York, and you could go to the north side, into Block Island Sound, and eventually up into Long Island Sound, and go to places up along the Connecticut shore. So Montauk was a key, a key point. And fortifying it became 
very significant. You'll see that you see that more in World War II. But here in World War I, uh, you know, things began to happen. Uh, there were reports of enemy submarines off Montauk Point, and all the more reason for having some sort of uh, operation out there. To uh, see to the needs of these men that were stationed out here, there was a local women's committee of the YMCA who provided clothing and other necessities. They set up a, sail a soldiers and sailors club right here in East Hampton. And in July of 1917, that's when the actual work began on the uh, buildings that were going to be at the Naval Air Station. They, op they operated on a 33-acre plot of land, which is just basically where the village of Montauk is today, between Fort Pond and the ocean. There was, there was a flat piece of land in there, and the centerpiece of the whole operation was a huge dirigible hangar. Uh, this was 122 feet long and 85 feet high, and inside this hangar was where dirigibles were kept. There was also a seaplane hangar out there. They uh, took off and landed using Fort Pond, which was nice in the nice weather. It got a little dicey in the winter because Fort Pond was fresh water and it would ice over. So it sometimes it caused some problems. Uh, barracks were built out here for 400 men, officers' quarters, etc. You know, and give you an aerial view of the station. There you can see right in the middle is the uh, airport hangar, right there. Now this this is like this would be Montauk Highway today. So this is pretty much where town is today when you go into Montauk. It's hard to believe at one time they had an operation like that going on. You also had the Coast Guard at Montauk at this time. Uh, in the early days, you had life-saving stations. And uh, after 1915, the Coast Guard officially became into, uh, into formation, and the Coast Guard took over a lot of these old life-saving stations. So you had stations at two places in Montauk, one at Ditch Plains and another one at Hither Plain, which actually would be uh, in this direction, probably about uh, maybe half a mile or a mile, I guess, west of where town is. <clears throat> You also had a contingent of the Naval Reserve, only five men, but they were stationed out at the Montauk Lighthouse. This base operated uh, during, for the course of the war, you know, with the seaplanes, the dirigibles operating. Uh, there was talk of the station becoming permanent, but that did not happen. And by August of 1919, uh, the base was officially shut down. And by 1920, the buildings were all removed. The big airport hangar was dismantled and was actually re was actually transported to Cape May, New Jersey. And from what I read, it was actually attached to an existing hangar, so it made it even bigger. I throw this picture in just to give you an idea of what uh, Montauk Highway was like going into the 1920s. Uh, this is before Robert Moses. Uh, eventually, his, his hand was going to be felt out in Montauk. Uh, this being the old highway, this is not the parkway. When you approach Montauk, if you know when you get to hit the hills, the road splits. The new highway that goes up the hill and goes all into town, that was Robert Moses' project. It's known as the Montauk Point State Parkway, and that was one of his. That was built actually in 1930 and 1931. And he built that stretch leading into the village, and then he uh, added a new section from where Third House is to the lighthouse. Because there used to be an old Montauk Highway that went around the hills to the lighthouse itself, but that was long abandoned, especially after Camp Hero was built. But this gives you an idea that it was literally, as some sources said, an adventure to get to Montauk in those days. It took quite a time. Now, something you may not know is that between World War I and World War II, there was a camp out in Montauk, and it was known as Camp Welsh. It was a field artillery camp in connection with what was called the Citizens Military Training Corps. 
It was basically for instruction. And during the years 1922 and 23, uh, soldiers would come out there and train. It was located on the southeast corner of Fort Pond, which uh, is probably in the vicinity of where the big office tower is today, a little bit east of that. And they conducted their uh, training and uh, uh, procedures out there for two years, 22 and 23. You had thousands of soldiers that came out from the regular army, the National Guard, and the uh, Citizens Military Corps uh, Field Artillery. The camp was discontinued in 1924. However, Montauk still had, occasionally had uh, ships coming in to spend time in Fort Pond Bay, going in maneuvers. Uh, in 1931, the Navy scouting fleet came into Fort Pond Bay. No less than 25 destroyers, 10 cruisers, two battleships, and an aircraft carrier, and 7,000 men. So Montauk really seemed to have that stigma attached to it that, hey, this is a good place for uh, military work, military practice. But now we get into some more serious stuff, and that's the Second World War. Uh, the entire East Coast of the United States was, in, at least in 1941, was threatened by German submarines. If you looked at a map of uh, the Atlantic in 1941, uh, the Germans were pretty much running rampant. The submarine their submarines were proving to be very effective. Uh, people began to worry about attacks in places like New York, Boston. Uh, Long Island, especially eastern Long Island, was seen as a likely invasion point. Here we are at Montauk again. And on January 14, 1942, the Panamanian tanker Nornis was sunk 60 miles southeast of Montauk Point. So it was, it was getting close to home. Uh, by the way, all aboard that noise were rescued. The Coast Guard, being at Montauk at that time, were conducting beach patrols. And it got to be more and more serious, especially when the United States got into the war, where these patrols were being run constantly, and unauthorized civilians uh, were prohibited from going anywhere near the Montauk Lighthouse. Uh, especially when Camp Hero was built as the army base out there. If you didn't have business at the end of the island, you would turn back. You would be stopped and questioned. So if anybody had plans to visit the lighthouse during that time, you weren't getting anywhere near it. Here's, the early, here's that fishing village again. Uh, I show it to you again because this is the last time you would see it. Because in 1942, the, the Navy sent notices to the people living in the village telling them they had 30 days to get out. They were going to flatten the village. They wanted Fort Pond Bay as a torpedo testing range. They wanted to set up a naval base here. It was a, it was a good spot for it. So the people were given 30 days to either physically move their houses, which some did. Others just abandoned their houses and the Navy just came in and just flattened them. This was wartime. They, they weren't playing games here. So by 1943, you had the Navy torpedo testing range and base set up at uh, the site of the old fishing village. Montauk Manor, which was built by Carl Fisher in the 1920s, was part of his grand plan to develop Montauk. Thank God that didn't work. Uh, but he did build this beautiful hotel, which today is uh, largely condominiums. But this building, which is, if you, if you saw this picture expanded, the old fishing village would be down the hill, because this was up on top of that Fort Hill I talked about before, would be down here. So you, you would have a bird's eye view of the fishing village from that hotel. That hotel was used by the military as uh, quarters for some of their officers and uh, other men. Uh, barracks, uh, barracks for enlisted men. Uh, it also, I should say, it also served as a barracks for enlisted men as well. It was a huge hotel. I mean, it had some like 170 rooms, I think. The Fisher Tower, which is the tall office building in the village of Montauk, that was used as an officer's quarters. 
Now, as far as that torpedo testing range is concerned, I know if any of you know Vinnie Grimes. Uh, Vinnie, uh, I love this guy. He is, he is so cool. Uh, he worked, I worked with him at the lighthouse for a couple of years. He, there was never a day I didn't go home laughing. Uh, he's got a great sense of humor. He still lives in Montauk. His, his family originally came from Nova Scotia, like a lot of the early uh, Montauk residents did. And, uh, you know, they, again, they, they set up fishing and other activity. Uh, Vinny, uh, I interviewed him, and uh, he had a story to tell about the torpedo testing range, which uh, is quite interesting. Because, it, it, by the fact of its name, it was a testing range, which meant they were going to test these torpedoes. Now, I'm quoting this from Vinny. This is from the book, American Gibraltar. He says, they used to fire the torpedoes from a PT boat tied at the dock. They had no warheads. Some of them would boomerang, go up the bank, smash up the docks, go everywhere. One landed in the back of a guy's pickup truck. The guy was a lobsterman and a pretty good drinker. And when he got up next morning and checked the back of his pickup, he went inside and asked his wife, was I carrying a load last night? <laughs> his wife said, yeah, he was pretty drunk. And he said, well, then I don't know where I picked this thing up. <laughs> so you know, this is just one of many stories. Apparently, these torpedoes were just going all over the place. But it's a good thing they tested them. Eventually, they did correct all these deficiencies. And the, the base managed to uh, operate into 1944. It didn't operate until the end of the war. Uh, by 1944, the war was really turning in favor of the Allies. Uh, the uh, Axis powers were pretty much on the run at that point. And the naval base at Montauk was closed. And uh, the equipment and personnel were transported to Newport, Rhode Island. And the base at Montauk was officially disestablished on March 1st of 1945. The buildings, by the way, that were in the torpedo testing range, they were sold to anyone who was interested on an all-cash basis. Some any remaining buildings were finally torn down in the 1980s. Uh, I think there's a place out there, uh, I think Stephanie, you probably know, Rough, Rough Riders Landing, I think mm -hmm. they call it, the condominium development. Mm -hmm. That's in, a, that's in a, a section of that old torpedo testing range. Maybe you can clarify that. Meanwhile, I've got, I've, got to bring my, I've got to bring my lighthouse into the picture here. Uh, these three men were working at the lighthouse uh, from 1930 until 1943. Uh, Thomas Buckridge was the head keeper at the time. He's the man on the left. Jack Miller is the gentleman in the middle. And George Washington Warrington was the man on the right. Uh, they worked together at the lighthouse for 13 years, and they never got along with each other. Be that as it may, they still managed to keep the lighthouse uh, operating in uh, good condition. However, things were going to change for them. Uh, in 1942, uh, Coast Guard were gradually taking over the lighthouse, and the Army began to gradually take over the point, as I said before. And I think in this picture you'll see what I mean. So you have the military out there. Here again is uh, Buckridge, Miller, and Warrington on the far right. This is taken out the lighthouse property in 42. The Army and the Coast Guard jointly occupied the lighthouse by 1943, actually by early 43, and those three civilian keepers departed. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the lighthouse property, you know that next to the lighthouse is another tall white building. This was the radar tower. Its official title is Fire Control Tower, but I always hesitate to call it that, especially to visitors at the museum, because people think right away I'm talking about a fire tower in like a state park, and they think there's a ranger up there looking for forest fires. What it meant was the radar equipment that was in the radar tower was used to survey the ocean for German submarines. If they were to spot a submarine, they would get the coordinates of where the submarine was transfer the information to Camp Hero, which was right next door, and Camp Hero had the big guns, the big cannons, that would fire uh, a 
thousand pound shell, 30 miles in defense. So that's why it's called fire control. They coordinated the firepower with Camp Kilo. <coughs> this picture is, to me, is a rarity. Uh, this was provided by the late uh, Arthur Dunn. Uh, he lived in Narragansett. Uh, he was a staff sergeant who was assigned to the White House in 1943 and spent three years there. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet up with him in 2008 and interview him. And uh, the time spent with him is, was priceless. It really was. Uh, he shared a lot of old photographs with me that I had never seen before. Here's that fire tower when it was completed. You can see it's uh, in camouflage. Uh, that small structure you see to the right of the tower, down here, that's the fog signal. And what Art told me, originally the fog signal was right up against the uh, fire tower. And when the fog signal would go off, it kind of shook things up in the radar tower so they had to move the fog signal away. This building down here, by the way, was the outhouse. They did have plumbing in the lighthouse in 1938. That's when they finally got plumbing. But this building actually had three separate doors. Remember, you had three keepers, so each family had their own compartment. During the war, the uh, bulb that was up in the lantern, which was a 1,000-watt bulb, was removed. And only a 100-watt bulb was installed. And the reason for that was that if you were in one of those German submarines and you're looking out your periscope and you're looking for Allied ships, can you imagine how beautifully a ship would be silhouetted against lights from the shoreline? That's why many lighthouses were either dimmed or darkened outright. But because Montauk Point was in an area where you had an awful lot of sea traffic, they didn't want to darken that light, so the, uh, the light was simply dimmed. This picture doesn't look very inviting, and that's the reason I include it. It's World War II. You know, this wasn't a, hi, welcome, come see the lighthouse kind of picture. It just kind of shows you that uh, you have that radar tower, you have the radio transmitting tower in front. It, it, it doesn't strike me as a warm picture, but it's meant to send a message. It's wartime, keep out. And that's basically what it was for the duration of the war. Adjacent to the lighthouse was the old Lathrop Brown estate, uh, and which included this beautiful window. Uh, however, the government wanted that property to construct Camp Hero, that military base. So uh, Lathrop Brown got rid of his estate, and the window wound up uh, over in, right it's over here in Wainscott in the uh, Georgia Association. It still stands. Uh, he used it primarily as like a, a tea room. And supposedly, when Thomas Buckridge was the keeper of the lighthouse, he was occasionally invited with his wife for tea. But when he came over there, Brown was always willing to offer him a little something more than just tea. But Thomas Buckridge was a teetotaler, and he would never drink anything uh, other than uh, soda or coffee or things like that. I guess he wasn't that much fun. Uh, the reason I know this, too, is because I interviewed his daughter. His daughter, Margaret Buckridge Box, is still living. She's in her 90s now. Uh, and she was uh, really the uh, impetus for one of the books I did write called Living on the Edge, which is Life at the Lighthouse in the 30s and 40s. And she shared a lot of personal memories about what it was like to live in the lighthouse back at those, in those days. These were, this is an example of one of the guns at Camp Hero. Uh, there were four of these huge guns there. They were called 16-inch guns. And this is, a, this is one of them. And this huge concrete battery was actually over 600 feet long. Had one gun at one end and one at the other. And then you had another battery elsewhere. The battery still exists in Camp Hero. Both batteries do. However, these guns were removed at the end of World War II. And this whole thing is all bricked up today, obviously, to prevent trespassers or vandals. But, you know, if there are World War II buffs in the room, you can go in there and they have plaques in front of these things that tell you the history of uh, what these uh, batteries were used for. The guns were 
pretty powerful, as I said before. Uh, being able to the, the uh, operation at Montauk, Camp Hero, the lighthouse, that was all part of what they called the Eastern Coast Defense Shield. You had operations like this from Maine to Florida, protecting our shores from the enemy. And I emphasize this, I mean, that, that was another reason I wrote American Gibraltar for this reason, is because these people who were stationed at camp, places like Camp Hero, even ordinary citizens who were airplane spotters should never be forgotten. I think everybody in this room probably knows somebody, whether it's in your own family or friends or whatever, who served in the Second World War and maybe saw active combat. My father was one of them. He was a little first lieutenant. But there were people who didn't fight in the front lines, but they served their country right here. And that part of the book, I think, is, and I'm glad I wrote it just to accentuate the role that these people were playing at home. In a sense, they were like the forerunners of today's homeland security, when you think about it. They were protecting our home front. That picture, there's two yeah. people standing in front. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know who they are, but this, this picture I've seen in many sources, that none will ever say who they are. There's a picture coming up, though, with someone that I, I will be able to show you. Oh, there yeah, it is. This is Fred Hausnecht. He, uh, he's still living in Montauk today. And he was stationed at Camp Hero after the war. You can tell by the date, 1947. Uh, he spent, uh, I think, three years there. And uh, after World War II, as you know, the Cold War era settled in. And uh, Camp Hero became less and less necessary, <coughs> excuse me, for the Army, and more necessary for the Air Force. So now you have the Air Force coming into Montauk. They basically took over most of Camp Hero, not all of it, they took over most of it, and uh, while Fred was here, uh, I, I had asked him, you know, what was the most important job that they had to do at that time? And uh, again, I'm quoting from the book, he said, we had to keep the fire lanes clear for the guns. He said, we had, to keep the, we had to keep them all cut all around the perimeter, meaning all the growth. That was one of the biggest things we had to do. One time, we had a big fire up there. For years, we had dumped the cuttings over the cliff, and somehow they caught fire. The fire department came, and we had one big time. And I remember when he told me that, his whole face lit up. I don't know how big a time it was, but I can't imagine a big fire, but uh, by 1949, these big guns, as I, I think I mentioned already, they were all removed. Uh, Fred himself, uh, as I said, still lives. Push that one button again. Fred still lives in Montauk today. He uh, he's, very, he's very adept at uh, construction, and uh, he's the owner of the East Deck Motel in Montauk, and I believe two other motels. He's quite an ambitious guy. I asked him, does he still do much work on the sites? He goes, well, nowadays I just point and I let the other guys do it. Fred's in his early 80s now. <clears throat> now you can see the influence of the uh, uh, Air Force moving in. They created what was called the Montauk Air Force Station in the 1950s, and these radomes were constructed. Uh, and of course, you know, radar technology, there was always something new coming along. And eventually, in, the in 1958, you had what was called SAGE radar installed. SAGE, S-A-G-E, which means semi-automatic ground environment. It was, there was an automated control system for tracking and intercepting enemy aircraft. Eventually, they would construct a dish. And you've, you've probably all seen that dish, that big radar dish that's out there. When that was activated in 1962, it could detect an aircraft 280 miles away. And you had only 12 of those uh, structures built in the United States. And the, the thing that's interesting is the one at Montauk is the only survivor. All the rest have been demolished. And as it was explained to me, when it came time to demolish the dish and the building at Montauk, the government looked at the price tag. And they said, leave it. They abandoned it. Which is just as well, because 
now it's the centerpiece of Camp Hero State Park. Uh, I've heard that uh, there's talk of maybe creating a, a, a military museum in the building itself, but that's nothing the Montauk Historical Society has anything to do with. It's on state land, and that's the state's uh, issue. There's, a, there's that dish. Now, the dish was very effective at detecting aircraft, but it, is, it did pose some problems. And for that, I go back to Vinnie Grimes again. Uh, when I asked him about that dish, he, he just went like this to me. He goes, oh, he said, he said, the big monster drove us nuts. He said, every, every time it went around, you'd get snow on the TV. And he says, and that sucker would wait until the guy on TV was heading for a touchdown, and there would come the snow. He goes, we spent fortunes on TVs, but the same damn thing happened, no matter what TV you got. That's, that's, that's been it. Uh, I interviewed uh, about 10 or 12 men, uh, not just from this area, but men who were from various parts of the United States, who at different times were stationed at Camp Hero, and they shared a lot of their memories with me there. Uh, they're all in that book as well. Uh, one gentleman, uh, his name is Bruce McAuliffe, uh, he's from Ohio, and uh, he shared a story with me once that when he was stationed at uh, Camp Hero, uh, they got word that a general was coming to visit. So he said, the men did their best to prepare for his arrival. As the time drew near, it was discovered that a particular jeep was filthy and dirty. When the question was put to the sergeant major as to how best and fastest to clean it, he said, use your imagination. So we ran it into the ocean. <laughs> it had a snorkel on it, so the engine would run while it was underwater. It came out a little waterlogged, but a lot cleaner than it had been before. Jeep. Now the dish here worked through the 60s into the 70s, but again, you know, with advances in technology, especially today, things become dinosaurs really quick. By the late 1970s, this thing was already becoming a dinosaur, and Camp Hero was fast becoming obsolete. By 1978, there were big, vast numbers of personnel being transferred out. Uh, the camp itself, or the military, I should say the Air Force Station at Camp Hero, officially shut down in 1981. And shortly after that, uh, the camp, the Air Force, uh, the Air Force Station was taken over by the state of New York, actually in 1984. And in 2002, it became Camp Hero State Park. Uh, I went to visit it in 2005, and here's, that, here's where that big cannon would have been. See, they bricked it all up in there now. You can see the protective top on where that uh, gun used to be underneath. And there's the old radar dish. You can't go in that today. It's all fenced in now because uh, it needs a lot of work. <laughs> that, hmm? You were at uh, Camp Hero? Hmm. Uh, when was this? Uh, let's see. I was recalled for the Korean War in 51. And uh, I was out there in 51 and 52 with a telephone company repairing their telephone lines. In those days, field artillery came with big guns and fired at Montauk. They came across the, the Shinnecock Canal in big trailers. Well, there, was, there were still maneuvers being done offshore. Yeah, well, these were. Yeah, I was stationed there in 58 and 59. In the Air Force. Oh, in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Oh, then uh, some of these pictures must bring back some memories for you. Is a this this was their gymnasium. Was this what, what what I didn't explain initially, and I should have, is that when Camp Hero was first built in World War II, it was disguised to look like a New England fishing village from the air. So this building, which was apparently supposed to be the church, was actually a gymnasium, and there were other buildings on the property that served other functions. But the whole idea was, if there was ever an enemy invasion. And these, their planes would fly over, and they would look down and just see this little village. What they wouldn't see were the guns suddenly come out and, you know, bang. And just as another view of the dish in 2005. Uh, 
it, it's kind of an eerie place to go into. It's very quiet and lonely in there, but if you were a World War II buff or, you know, Cold War, it's historic. There are a lot of descriptive plaques in there that explain what different things are. So it's really quite interesting. Uh, the last part of this is that the, you also had the Coast Guard out there. Initially, you had, as I said earlier, life-saving stations, such as this one at Ditch Plains in Montauk. And you had also had one at, uh, at Hither Plain, which is visible right here. I should have used this arrow. It would have been easier. This is the old Montauk Highway, and there is the Hither Plains station. Uh, that building has uh, since been demolished. Uh, but these, this is where the Coast Guard would emerge from and conduct their beach patrols. The Coast Guard stations were about four miles apart from each other, so when they did their patrols, they would basically meet up with one another. And this became all the more significant during the Second World War. At one of the stations, the Amagansett Station, uh, there was an incident that occurred that put Amagansett and Long Island on the map, literally. Uh, because Amagansett was the scene of a Nazi invasion, supposedly the only Nazi invasion uh, in the United States. Apparently in June of 1942, four Germans came ashore from a submarine uh, at uh, the beach in Amagansett and they had sabotage in mind. Uh, you're seeing eight pictures here because the, uh, the, the four on the top were the ones that came ashore at Amagansett. The four on the bottom came ashore near St. Augustine, Florida. It was all part of the same operation. It was called Operation Pastorius. And the word Pastorius comes from the first, supposedly, excuse me, the first German immigrant to come to this country in the 1700s. Uh, believe, and I think he was one of the founders of Germantown, Pennsylvania. But that's, that's another story. Apparently, yes. They're going to have a reenactment of this. Are they? Yes, um, in June. It's the 70th say. anniversary. Right. I was just reading about it in Dan's paper. That, 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 that I'd be interested to hear about. That, that's very significant. Well, that story is what we're going to go into right now. Uh, the gentleman that you see on the top, the four of them, the one on the far right, right here, he's George Dash. He was the ringleader of the entire operation. All eight of these men had previously spent time in the United States in the late and mid-1920s, so they were familiar with our language, they were familiar with our customs, but then, of course, as we know, the infamous crash of 2029 20, changed everything. Uh, these men all you know, were kind of looking for an answer. Well, as I used to be a teacher, and what I used to teach my kids is that, uh, you know, in the United States, they were looking for leadership. Franklin Roosevelt emerged as a strong leader. In Germany, they were looking for a leader. Adolf Hitler emerged as a strong leader. Both of them got people working again. Both of them eliminated unemployment. But then, as we know, one of them kind of went off the rails a little bit. But these men believed in, uh, that they had better chances in Germany. So they left the United States, went back to Germany. But when Hitler's regime was gaining steam, George Dash didn't really like what he was seeing. He secretly wanted to come back to the United States. This was his chance. He volunteered for Operation Pastorius. Hitler himself was so impressed with George Dash and all of these men that he was confident that this operation was going to be successful and they were going to be able to blow up munitions factories, railroad tracks, and you know, basically do damage to the country. But what they didn't know is that George Dash wanted to, like I said, come back here. So when they landed on the beach at Amagansett, uh, on the June 9th of 1942, George Dash comes face to face with John Cullen. Um, one of my deepest regrets is that he recently passed away. Uh, I did some searching about two years ago and I tracked down where he was. I he was living, I believe, in North Carolina. I spoke with his wife. And at that time, she said, I didn't know if John Cullen was still living. And she says, oh, yeah, he's, he's alive. And I said, is he there? I said, could I talk to him? She says, you can talk to him, but he has Alzheimer's. You know, he 
he'll speak to you, but he remembers nothing of that day. I was, I was so, I felt so bad for the man, for him being ill, but I was so, I, you know, as a historian, you think you're that close to real history, and I couldn't, I couldn't hear it from his own lips. That was just, that was a disappointment. But nevertheless, he confronted Dash on the beach, and Dash and the men had orders to kill if they were confronted. But Dash must have looked into the eyes of Colin. Colin, as you can see, he's a young man. He was like 21 years old at the time. Dash said to him, do you think you'd recognize me if you saw me again? And Colin was no talk. He says, I've never seen you before. I don't even know who you are. So Dash reaches into his pocket, grabs his hand, and he says, here, here's $300. And 